roll on. Good morning. It is the 14th of February. It is Valentine's Day and in the church, we celebrate today the Feast of the Transfiguration. Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, to this worried world you reveal your presence in radiant glory and in gentle whispers. On mountaintops, and in shadowed valleys, in classrooms and hospital beds, in homes and in churches, in the quiet of nature and on busy streets. Yours is the presence that pushes past our fear to calm us. Yours is the love that transforms our doubt with reassurance. We come to dwell in your goodness and offer you the praise you deserve. Amen. And now the collect for this day. God of the outstretched hand, in Christ you are moved with anger and pity at a world which labels and rejects its children. Release us from the lie that we are born unclean and shape a new community where all may be accepted through Jesus Christ, who transfigures and transforms and sets us free. Amen. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, as, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken away from you. Elisha said, Please, please. Let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha, Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen but when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though night still covers the earth and darkness covers the nations, over you will the Lord arise. Over you will his glory appear. Nations will stream to your light. 
and kings to your dawning brightness. Your gates will always be open. Day or night, they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord. The Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land. Ruin or destruction within your borders. You will name your walls salvation. You will call your gates praise. No longer will the sun be your light by day. No longer the moon give you light by night. The Lord will be your eternal light. Your God will be your glory. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this day, this Feast of the Transfiguration is another one of those days in the church year that makes preachers nervous. It is one which is tricky to preach on, but it helps if we go back and begin to set things in context a bit, then it begins to make, I think, some sense. I want to start by reading a short passage to you from a wonderful book by Chet Myers. It's called Binding the Strong Man. Listen to what Chet has to say. Mark's story of Jesus stands virtually alone among the literary achievements of antiquity for one reason. It is a narrative for and about the common people. The gospel reflects the daily realities of disease, poverty, and disenfranchisement that characterize the social existence of first century Palestine's other 95%. In the very first scene of the story, the crowds are there flocking to John the Baptist and his subversive promise of a new order. Throughout the narrative of Jesus' ministry, the crowds are there, continually pursuing, interrupting, and prevailing upon him. Jesus' compassion is always first directed toward the unfortunate masses and their overwhelming needs and demands. He responds to their desperate situation of hunger and hopelessness and nurtures their dreams of liberation. In all its heroic, comic, and tragic elements, Mark's drama of Jesus portrays the world of first century Roman Palestine from below. It breaks the culture of silence of the poor by making them fishers and farmers, the lame and the leprous, the central subjects and protagonists of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Put another way, 
The mission and ministry of Jesus was about initiating and introducing a new social order, social order based on love and justice. The kingdom of God that he proclaimed, that he preached, the good news that he preached, it was about that new social order. But the good news was clearly not good news for everyone. You recall when Jesus preached in Nazareth in the synagogue, after he finished, they wanted to throw him off a cliff. And it was that mission of introducing a new social order, it was that ministry of proclaiming the good news that would get him killed. Hold on to that thought. Just before our passage today, you will remember that Jesus was with his disciples <clears throat> just outside of Caesarea Philippi, a place where there was a shrine, a shrine where Caesar was worshiped as a God. And in that place, he had to sort things out with his disciples. He had to find out if they were getting it. I mean, this motley crew just seemed so thick. And so he said to them, who do people say that I am? And you remember they said, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist. That wasn't taking him anywhere. So we said, who do you say that I am? Are you getting this? And, and you remember Peter said, you, you are the Messiah. And at that point, at that point, Jesus began to reconstruct their image, their vision of what it meant to be Messiah. It was not about power. It was not about might. It was about suffering and death. There was no throne, there was only a cross. And, and at that point, Peter tried to talk Jesus out of this road trip to Jerusalem. It, it was not a good idea. And that's when, when Jesus said to his disciples, listen, listen guys, if you want to be my disciples, it's not about prestige or power or privilege. You need to take up your cross and follow me wherever it leads. Okay, today, today, six days after that moment, Jesus takes Peter and James and John, the three stalwarts of the home team. He takes them up to the top of a mountain, probably Mount Hermon, which was about 9,000 feet high, a mountaintop from which it felt like you could see the whole world but he wasn't there for the view. He was there for a kind of retreat with the three leaders. They needed to figure things out and make sure the course was set. While they were there, some strange things began to happen. And for us to understand these strange things, we have to remember that in terms of scripture, mountaintops, were thin places. They were places where God was experienced. Moses and Elijah, two people who figure prominently in our story today, had their own mountaintop experiences, both on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. Both came at times that were challenging, incredibly hard in their particular lives and ministries. Elijah was a hunted man whose life was in danger. Moses was the leader of a group of people who didn't want to listen to him. And in both cases, they encountered God on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and, and were strengthened and equipped to do the work that God had in mind for them. Okay, so here we are on yet another mountaintop. And the first thing that happens in this story is it says that Jesus was transfigured, that suddenly his clothes were whiter than any possible light. That light in the story of Moses so long ago was a sign that Jesus had had an up close and personal encounter with Yahweh. This was a God moment. It's a God moment. And then, and then, suddenly, these three disciples see standing beside Jesus, Elijah and Moses. Now for us to figure out what this is about, 
They're not just window dressing here. In Hebrew tradition, Moses and Elijah were to be the precursors of the end of time. Their coming was a sign that the reign of God, the kingdom of God, was breaking in. You remember Jesus, when he first began to preach in John's gospel, said, the kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent and believe the good news. This moment, Moses and Elijah, are a validation that the kingdom of God ha has, in fact, drawn near. Peter, he, he just doesn't know what to make of all of this. He's confused. And so he blurts out, listen, why, why it's good being here. Why don't I just build three buildings, three tents, and, and we can just stay here. I, I think what's going on is that he knew he couldn't talk Jesus out of the road trip to Jerusalem at the bottom of the mountain. Maybe up here with this incredible view and Moses and Elijah with him, maybe together they can make him stay here and keep him safe. Maybe together they could make sure they were all safe. There didn't need to be a death in their future. Okay, that brings us to the moment the hinge moment in Mark's gospel. Everything from the opening sentence in Mark's gospel to this moment is about the identity and authority of Jesus. Everything that comes after here takes us to the cross. This is the hinge, the critical moment. And at this moment, the voice from the cloud, the voice of God says, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. And, and at that moment, at that moment in Mark's gospel, God is speaking to Peter, and James, and John. God is speaking to the hearers, the first hearers of Mark's gospel. And God is speaking to you and Peter and James and John, this was the validation that all of the preaching and teaching of Jesus was to be trusted. It was a validation that the trip to Jerusalem, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection were not optional. It was going to happen. Jesus' words were to be trusted. To the first hearers of Mark's gospel, people who were followers in the way at the very height of the Jewish-Roman conflict, at the very height of the violence and the murder and the suffering, these words, this is my son, listen to him, were words that would give them strength and give them hope to continue following in the way, to continue living and loving, to continue to do their part to bring about the kingdom. What about you and I? Well, it's February. It is Black History Month. And Black History Month this year comes after a time of incredible racial tension. And it is a month and we are asked to look at the, the history of slavery and suffering of oppression and hatred that has been inflicted upon black people in North America and all over the world. And in spite of that, in spite of that reality, there are still those who refer to people of color as those people. In our own country, in this year of pandemic, we have been reminded, reminded again and again of the poverty, of the poor living conditions, of the poor access to medical help, 
that our First Nations people have to live with, especially in the North. And too often, we hear people in the South saying they need to take responsibility for their own lives. Well, Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you. The kingdom of God belongs to you. And the voice from the cloud said, this is my son. Listen to him. In the Western world in which we live, time and time again, we see corporations and governments, the system that drives our culture, making economic decisions that benefit the rich, the comfortable, the powerful, and increase the marginalization and the suffering of the poor. We live at a time in this pandemic year when we see the wealthy countries are buying millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of doses of vaccines and are fighting one another for access to it and creating barriers to access to the vaccines. They are behaving as if they are elbowing one another out of the way at a department store boxing day sale at the very time when in the poorest countries of the world, access to the vaccine seems to be denied. The likelihood seems very, very unrealistic that they will ever see it. And the possibility, the probability of catastrophic results is inevitable. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And God said, this is my son. Listen to me. To the church today, to those who would call themselves Christians on this day, on this day, I believe God is saying, if you are going to be followers of Jesus, you cannot simply stay on the mountaintop and enjoy the view. You cannot simply say, I have got my ticket to heaven punch, so all is good. If you want to be followers of Jesus, you have to pick up your cross, take up your cross, and follow him down to the bottom of the mountain to the place where there is sickness and suffering and poverty and death. We need to take up our cross and do our part to transfigure and transform the world in Jesus' name. This story of the transfiguration is the hinge point in the gospel. My friends, what if today, what if today is the hinge point in the history of the world? What if our decision to listen, to really listen to him or not? What if our decision to take up our cross and follow him or not? What if that decision is the hinge which decides the future of our world? God said, this is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. And now, I want to invite you, I want to invite you to make a commitment to take up your cross and follow Jesus as we work together to transfigure and transform the world. And so I ask you, do you renounce oppression, structural and internal, and all the forces that keep us from living lives dedicated to the dignity of all human beings? I renounce them. 
Do you renounce the fear that dwells in you, all its insecurities, those things that draw you away from loving your neighbor? I renounce them. Do you renounce all answers to the cry of the oppressed that would belittle or demean, knowing that together we are never alone? I renounce them. Do you renounce all ideologies that would claim that some deserve to thrive while others based on culture, class, creed, or nation of origin have no such entitlement? I renounce them. Do you renounce the destruction of the earth and its resources, the devaluation of nature as the planet is sacrificed for human greed, leading to the possibility of unimaginable calamity for future generations. I renounce them. Do you renounce racism, sexism, and ableism? I renounce them. Do you renounce xenophobia and elitism? I renounce them. Do you renounce all these things? I renounce them with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. I renounce them. I renounce them. As we work toward liberation and life for all creation, I renounce them. Let me ask you, do you renounce them? I renounce them. Do you renounce them? I renounce them. Do you renounce them? I renounce them. Then, Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let all God's children say, Amen.
on this day. Our God calls us to listen, to listen to his son, to take up our cross and follow him wherever he may lead. And so we respond to that gospel, to that good news by saying together the hear, O Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. God of life, God of love, you created us and set us in relationship with each other, in families and neighborhoods, communities and countries, cultures and nations. We give you thanks for all the supportive relationships which bring meaning and encouragement to our lives and have meant so much in times of isolation. Help us contribute what we can to sustain the well-being of our community for all who call it home. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. God of our faith and of our future, there are so many pressures on homes and families today. Draw near to those who are struggling in economic difficulty and those burdened by the challenges to health and happiness this winter. Work with parents and children, partners and next door neighbors who face conflict in their relationships. Help them to create solutions that express mutual respect and resolve tension. Help our congregation support families whatever their size or situation, as well as people living on their own, to know your love. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of mercy and forgiveness, you call us to live together in peace and unity. We pray for our neighbors and our nation, where people are divided and bitterness turns into resentment. Show us how to work for reconciliation. As the pandemic stretches on, we pray for all those whose skill and dedication is needed to support our common life. Wherever we can, may we offer words of encouragement and appreciation so others know how much they matter to you and to us all. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Today, we give thanks for our church family and for the years of worship and witness offered here. So much has changed for us over these past few months and so much is about to change. We pray you will bless Linda, our primate, Anne, our metropolitan, Todd, our bishop, and all those who minister in our diocese either ordained or lay. We give thanks for those who have to think carefully and creatively so congregational life continues. We give thanks today for the work of our selection committee who have faithfully completed their task. We pray for Aidan, appointed to be our new incumbent, and we pray for Sarah, his wife, and William and Bennett, his children, knowing how challenging the next few weeks will be as they say farewell to a parish family they love and prepare to start a new life here. Give them peace and strength and joy in this time of transition. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We remember those of our number in need, need of your special attention today. Guide us all with your wisdom and insight so we find ways to reach out to each other in support and friendship. Open our eyes to opportunities to reach out beyond our fellowship as agents of your healing and hope. God, in your mercy, 
Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Not all is as it seems. There is glory hidden all around us, waiting to be revealed to those who see through eyes of faith who look beyond what seems inevitable, who choose not to live in the status quo, not in fear, but in the promises of God. Hold on to the vision as we prepare to journey from ashes to Easter. While well, the path can be difficult, life is often filled with challenges. We are not immune to struggle but there is greater glory yet to be revealed. And so the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.